Hello and welcome to episode 356 of the 21st Century Work Life podcast, where we talk about how the world of work and our attitudes to work are changing. And today we have our monthly recommendations episode, which is the audio companion to the email monthly newsletter. And you can sign up to the newsletter over at virtualnotdistant.com slash newsletter. And in fact, today's episode is a bit of a fusion between the what's going on type episodes and the recommendations because with me today is... Say your name. It's me, Maya Middlemiss. Hello. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll cut that, but no, I'll leave it in, I'll leave it in. <laughs> you froze for a minute and I didn't know where we were up to. So. <laughs> now, this is the thing, because, you know, with all the generative AI and everyone's saying, oh, you have to be more human. Oh, that was human then, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, that was human. I'm thinking that's one of the things for people to know that we are still, for now, we're still us. It's, uh, we'll just leave. It makes my editing uh, job easier. And, uh, you know, maybe people might uh, giggle, which is <laughs> nice. <laughs> so we are recording on the 17th of April, 2024. And uh, yeah, when I did uh, March's episode on recommendations with Marcus Wermuth, I I had so much fun and I thought, let's do these episodes with someone else rather than on my own. And uh, anyway, this month uh, we had to skip an episode because of I was on holiday. But um, so thank you for being here, Maya, to share your recommendations. It's always good fun to do this and to see what we've come across and been listening to, reading, thinking about um, in the time since we last spoke. What was interesting, I thought I'd just share with the listeners because I wonder... And I would love to hear from listeners about this. I wonder whether some of our listeners are in the same headspace as in when we started preparing the episode, neither of us had lots of things we'd read about remote work. And <laughs> I don't know. And I think maybe for me, that reflects on kind of where maybe a lot of people who've been in the remote work space have been for a long time is in that, okay, let's let's move on. Let's feed ourselves with different things. Yeah, I think you have to step outside of your narrow lane sometimes just for interest and stimulation. And it doesn't mean that nothing's happening or there's nothing new in yeah. remote work. It's just that if we only spend our time there, we won't make those synergies and connections. And I suppose because a lot more of the work I'm doing now is with people trying to get into remote work or trying to find more flexibility, trying to do new things. I feel I need to be more connected around the edges of remote mm -hmm. work rather than the cutting edge of what's happening in that deep remote infrastructure already. The people already got it. <laughs> so I'm trying to, to work around the boundaries a little bit more. Oh, that's good, because I wasn't able to do that when I was doing my training. <laughs> I wasn't able to remove myself as much, and I, and I needed that. Um, for me, I, I just listened and read a lot about, uh, well, listening. I listen to a lot of podcasts about writing, mm. and I have been reading a lot of personal development things. So, I mean, we've, I've got some to, to share. Always uh, happy to do that. So, anyway, uh, people, <laughs> listeners, Pilar at... at Adventures in podcasting, no. Pilar at virtualnotdistant.com if you have any similar thoughts. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that I've come across a lot of things around hybrid. Mm. And I don't know, I, it might be the resistance in me saying no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't find the literature and the thinking around hybrid very interesting. So also a lot of the stuff that's being written now is about that. So... I give it yeah, I suppose some of it's more descriptive or trying to mm -hmm. see what's going on in return to work policies and things like that and trying to figure it out of oh, this is what's happening. So let's try and describe it and see what its impact is, not is this something that we should be aspiring to or planning for? I think a lot of people, I think you're, the way you just expressed that reflects a lot of the sentiment around hybrid itself as a concept that yeah it's not not as interesting um, but this is what we've got maybe that's what we have to talk about um, but we've talked about it a lot actually and I don't feel like there's much new being said. No and a lot of the things that are being released are about the aim is to help people to do things hybrid and so I, I mean I'm as a reader I'm not interested mm. in, I don't like the how-to thing so I think maybe that's also 
That's also why. Anyway, but listeners, if you come across anything that's like, wow, no, this, you should read this. Prove us wrong. (laughs) Prove us wrong. Yes, please, please, (laughs) always, always. Right. So we'll start with the articles, then we'll move on to some books, and then we'll move on to some listens. And well, let's start in something that is, I, I like what you said about On the Edges, which is actually out of remote work, but that I've come across recently, and I'm really enjoying it's in a blog, which is now a book also, called sketchplanations.com. Is, is, it, is that? It's sketches that explain things. And this particular one I thought was interesting was called The Pyramid Principle, and it's about organizing ideas to communicate clearly. And it talks about the difference between thinking bottom up to communicating top down and it's just i won't go into it because i think listeners should should mm-hmm. go and read it because and then look at the sketch which is what i like about it it's really about just flipping how you communicate an idea which has a sad result at the end of it or is trying to solve a problem so i i, I recommend that yeah, it's, it's actually a great connection with remote work and async as well. Just thinking about new ways of communicating clearly um, and visually. I just can't do the sketching thing. That So I, I really admire you and people who can do these amazing sketch notes and explanations. Um, I have to do it with words, which sometimes feel quite clunky by comparison. Yeah, it's so wonderful. So it's sketchplanations.com is the web is the the site have a look have a look Maya what have you got for us what have I got well uh, again reading sort of more around than strictly on remote work but one of the things that's always interesting to me is the sort of policies around borderless business and work and there was an article in Skift about how remote workers are reshaping corporate travel policies, which is essentially about the need for organisations to support workations and flexible remote working, in many cases to prevent that happening by stealth. And rather than find out that the person you thought was on your payroll down the road has actually been on a Caribbean island for three months. And in fact, the health policy or their employment contract is no longer valid (laughs) for that reason. Um, or you find out through through some other means, then you know it's better to get out in front of it, address this as a need, as as something that you can offer, even as as a competitive differentiation in recruitment and retention. If you support that flexibility, then you know it's something people want these days. So it's going to have to go in to corporate travel policies and employment contracts and new ways of getting work done with people. I have to say, I, did, I, I managed to read this one and I think it is really interesting because it brings up things like, okay, if you're having a meeting and the remote worker needs to travel, who pays mm. for that? Yeah. Just things like that, that before, in a lot of places, just you wouldn't think about it. So Yeah. Or how do you split the costs if they want to stay for another three days at the end yes. of that meeting? Because yeah. actually, it, it's something I've been grappling with for, for years and it, it I found it really difficult to navigate in employment, even in self-employment. It's tricky just like from a tax, but is this a business trip or what if I go and see my friend as well? You know, do we call it a meeting? Um, What what am I, you know, I want to try and play fair with the thing, but the the point is it often makes sense if you're going to be somewhere to try and just for the air miles and the carbon, just to (laughs) do a few different things. So we haven't got these hard edges anymore between, even when you're registering a flight and it, it says on the airline website, is this for travel for business or for leisure? And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know which <laughs> box I should be ticking here. I know it only, it's only about what kind of receipt you get, but actually that line is probably permanently blurred now. And I guess we wouldn't have it any other way, but it's going to take a while for the contract law to catch up. Yeah, really. Yeah, so that is called How Remote... Well, we'll um, put all the links in the show notes anyway, but How Remote Workers Are Reshaping Corporate Travel Policies and that's over at skift.com and it's from April 7th, 2024th. 2024th? 2024. <laughs> I've got, I'm going to go for the really meaty one that I found. And this is, this is I mean, this is one of those... Uh, almost should be in the book section is such a long (laughs) piece it really is a long coffee read but I really liked it I I have to say in the way in a way what we were talking about before um, that I was struggling actually to come up with things for these recommendations and so I went over to Eva Rimbaud Gilabert's Twitter or X uh, because I'm back there but I'll talk about that later and 
I just know she shares really meaty stuff. So I found one. And this is a paper from the Human Resource Management Journal. It was actually published on the 25th of June, 2022. So it's a little bit old. But it's called E-Voice in the Digitalized Workplace, Insights from an Alternative Organization. So just to give you a little bit of overview to see whether you want to head over there uh, or not, it's in the Wiley Library. When they're talking about e-voice, they're talking about employee voice, and in, in this case, digital. And employee voice, to quote, describes how employees' concerns express and advance interests, solve problems, and contribute to and participate in workplace decision making. And they're saying that the focus of the paper is on direct voice. That is, mechanisms that enable individual involvement and participation rather than indirect voice like unions, etc. So it's it's more of a, I found it more of a case study mm -hmm. about what they call alternative organizations, which is quite a flat hierarchy when there's lots of collective decision making. And it's got a quick summary at the top. So listeners, you can go have a look, look at the summary. And if that's interesting, then invest a little bit of time in reading. I think for me, it's just it's. It, it, Sometimes when I'm thinking about flatter organizations, self-management, I don't think about some of the things that they've brought up, like some of the issues, some of the, I wouldn't say drawbacks, but some of the challenges that people actually have in bringing, in, in raising their voice in a way. We always think, oh, it should be easier, but actually there's just different kind of barriers. So from that point of view, I found this article interesting. Yeah, I'm curious to have a dig into this at some point. It does it does seem really interesting because the we've always there's always been research, academic research into workplace communications and hierarchies and management power and things like that, but so often that's relied on quite anecdotal and reflective yeah. evidence whereas now we actually have all this digitized. It would be very interesting to see. Obviously this is a qualitative approach based on semi interviews so it is reflective but I wonder if we could ever put some kind of data analysis against it to see if, I don't know I'm sort of thinking yeah. out here I'm not proposing to do this study myself but yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, we should be able to kind of go beyond that and back it up with some data now somehow. yeah um, and yeah, it'd yeah. be interesting to see anyway what difference that made Yeah, interesting. So yes, so we put the, again the article. Uh, it, it's a few years uh, old. E voice in the digitalized workplace: insights from an alternative organization. What else are you recommending, Maya? I love this doing this with someone else. Great, <laughs> this is quite fun, isn't it? Well, I wanted to share something that I came across. Actually, I came across it on a podcast, and then I went and looked up the story. I still haven't downloaded the app, but did you know? Because obviously, what we're really short of in 2024 is social networks. We don't have enough oh. of them. <laughs> There simply aren't enough places that we can go and share our <laughs> thoughts online with strangers. Um, and the latest kid on the block is Air Chat. This seems to be Silicon Valley's latest offering from Naval Ravikant. Um, apparently, the, uh, the last thing I heard was that it's closed to new members, so victim of its own success and so on, which is one reason I haven't bothered to download it yet because, you know, I don't want to get in line with everybody. Yeah. But what I thought was interesting about it was that it's audio. And the last time we had an audio first thing was Clubhouse, if anybody remembers that. It feels like a long time ago, but apparently it still exists. But I don't yeah. suppose any of us have logged into it for goodness knows what. This is the next idea with voice, but it's sort of asynchronous voice. It's voice clips. So it's a bit more like a Voxer or, or I suppose the way we're getting used to sharing voice notes in things like WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. People record a voice note and then it immediately goes live, but with a transcript as well. So it's sort of indexable wow. and scannable. Um, and apparently the AI is very good and the transcript's very accurate. Um, there was a mention of it, I think it was in a BBC podcast recently that said it's at the moment it's all sort of quickly going into horrible tech bros shouting over each other about their latest token launches and things like that. But, you know, maybe that's the early adopter thing. Maybe maybe there will be a, a second wave, especially if they scale up the infrastructure, if it's being so popular. But I just thought it's nice to see audio 
having a little bit of another moment. It was maybe yes. as podcasters, we're biased, but that's always nice. But the idea of async audio, I think, is something that's maybe not really been done before. So perhaps perhaps we'll be streaming this live on air chat at some point. So you heard it here first, if you not come across this one. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I hadn't heard about this. This is great. So this is why wow, really new April 15th, really 2024. New, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Air chat is Silicon Valley's latest obsession. And this is from Wired on Wired.com. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried. Uh, I was determined to give a good LinkedIn audio a good go, but I did my first one and no one turned up. And then I was like, oh, I'm going back. If I'm going to be on my own, I might as well podcast. <laughs> yeah, I th- it's the same with Twitter audio. I feel like, you know, yeah, a couple of years ago, everyone was trying to follow Clubhouse and put audio everywhere. Just yeah. like the year before that, it was let's do stories everywhere. Um, and spaces. And maybe the, yeah, maybe there just isn't necessarily, we don't need audio everywhere, but if audio has its own place where people go specifically for that, then maybe maybe that's what audio needs because audio just gets distracted by visible stuff and yeah, that's things true. on the screen. So maybe if we're going to actually do this, it needs to be something you do away from screen, which is also something that is interesting and good to support, hopefully. Great. Good. So we can maybe, I'll go on to the, it's actually a recommendation that's just going to take us now into our into our books section because it's actually it came through as a reply to the newsletter from last month and I was so excited <laughs> because it's to have in fact we had two recommendations from that one so and this was actually from Jack Niles and Jack Niles He, well, he is the author of Managing Telework, Strategies for Managing the Virtual Workforce, which was published by Wiley in 1998. The original remote worker. Yes, the original (laughs) any of us. (laughs) Teleworker. um, And I don't know, I've seen some interviews saying, oh, he's the grandfather of telework and things like that. You know, people love putting uh, labels on them. Um, But he he replied to the last one and he recommended uh, there's a new documentary and it's called Work Different. I think Mm. there's another one called very similar, but this is uh, from a Canadian producer production company I think and and in fact Jack is uh, featured quite uh, heavily on it when I was doing research for uh, for this and looking at the documentary to see if I could watch it I came across a long article that actually also talks about Jack and how he was he he was in NASA when he started teleworking and it's, it's a fascinating story so I'll leave listeners to to read through that through the article in the in create Aster.ca. But he recommended this documentary work different and it looks at the shift to working from home from all angles. And I also put a link to the blog, to Jack Niles blog, which is over at J-A-L-A-H-Q dot com slash blog. So it looks really interesting, actually. I'm going to have to bookmark that blog. <laughs> Loads I want to read. There. He's still blogging yeah, as well. Fantastic. He's still in the space. I mean, <laughs> you know, I didn't <laughs> last very long. But <laughs> It's still there. It's amazing. Amazing. So, yeah, so I suppose you can also, you uh, I mean, uh, managing telework strategies for managing the virtual workforce is, is not in Kindle. So I haven't read it, uh, but it is in paperback still from Amazon. So check that out. Let's move on to books then. Do you want to start, Maya, with, uh, with okay. your uh, Dory Clark uh, recommendation? Yeah, this was an unusual one. And I'm trying to remember where I came across it because this was a new author to me. I'm sure it was probably something recommended on a podcast. But yeah. I recently enjoyed um, the author read audiobook of Dory Clark's The Long Game, which is really about sort of long range planning and trying to have some kind of overarching life strategy or goals and accepting having to maybe sometimes compromise or go in different directions. But I think the big takeaway from, I'm always reading these kind of things. I figure I'm going to figure out my life one day and (laughs) figure out the big plan. Uh, But what I think I took away from this most strongly was the idea that you can decide about how you're going to make decisions and that it's possible to develop a kind of a framework or a, a heuristic for how you decide about things. Because Obviously, the author's perspective is that you you should consider the long term view, you know, not what do I want to do today, but how will this impact me in a year or 10 years or the next generation or whatever. But there are so many different ways you can look at the decision making framework. So if you don't know what to do in a given situation, then you can at least examine it 
through different lenses. And one that I particularly liked at, at the end of the day, if you haven't got any other overarching priority to apply here or life goal, when in doubt, optimize for interesting. So yeah. <laughs> everything else being equal, do the thing that's fun or intriguing or maybe the least known outcome. You know, obviously ah. weighing up risk and everything else that might be in the mix, but optimize for interesting, I think, is, is words I'd like to live by. Yes, excellent. So Dory Clark, The Long Game. Mm -hmm. I read Entrepreneurial You. <laughs> Monetize your expertise, create multiple income streams and thrive. This is, I read it quite a long time ago and I did enjoy it. And all of her other ones are on my wish list. So, you know, I heard the other day, so I listened to Rachel Heron, who's a writer. She's she's an American writer. She's moved to New Zealand. She has a podcast called Ink in Your Veins. Mm -hmm. she's, her main interest is memoir. She's a beautiful writer for that. And she was saying about how sometimes it's not as much, it just reminded me, not as much about making the right decisions as making the decisions right. Mm -hmm. As in, it's interesting that you're saying something to help you make a decision because actually sometimes it's so difficult, but sometimes... I think, well, let's just, well, I don't think like this, but what she's saying is let's make a decision, go with it. Yeah. It doesn't mean just stick to one path, but do what it takes to make that right, whatever it ends yeah. up being. Uh, sometimes it's not always obvious what the right decision is. And that's when having different lenses to consider it from can, even if it just throws up different choices or helps you rule out a possibility that actually, no, I wouldn't want that, that outcome in 10 years or that that would actually cost me too many resources or whatever. It, it can narrow your focus a bit. So, yeah, yeah definitely. Nice. Interesting ways to think about thinking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've just started reading, I, and I, I might have, I'm sorry, listeners or readers of the newsletter if I've uh, introduced this book before there, because it's Hidden Potential by Adam Grant. And he brought this book out, I think it was last year. I really like Adam Grant. He's his stories, what he says. I really like his voice. But just I've just started, I think I've read the first chapter and it talks about, it's exactly about that. It's about hidden potential. Like not everyone's talent is obvious. Not everyone who's been successful or who does a lot of their thing is the best person and has lots of talent. But actually sometimes this is discovered along the way. This is something that sometimes takes a while. That's the, I mean, the title, Hidden Potential. And it just reminded me, I went to a voiceover for a very long time with a friend of mine called Fran. And he's a translator. He's a Catalan translator. He lives in London. He's also, he also works as a voiceover. That's what he's done all his adult life. And About a year ago, he just picked up a pencil. His uh, husband draws, sometimes for fun, draws uh, portraits. He draws people. And he said, oh, friend, have a look. No, 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 I've never, I've never done any drawing. No, 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 have a look. And he picked up the pen, drew, I don't know what he drew first. And his husband is like, that's very good. And he started to develop it. And he showed me his portraits. The first one he showed me was one he'd done of Ian McKellen. And I was like, that's Ian McKellen. Yes. Uh -huh. And then he was swiping. He had them on his phone. He just, yeah, it's just this thing I've developed, this little hobby. And it was amazing. It wasn't just that the people looked exactly like, because I knew some of them, and like how they were. But the traces the drawing, the shadowing, the level of detail in the people's faces and necks and and talk about hidden potential. He's, he's my age, I think he's a bit older, 55 or something. And it's the first time he's played with that. How amazing. And yet, yeah, that was there because you must be born with, with, you know, you can practice a skill like that, but it must depend on some innate talent that, you know, I can't make something, a drawing that looks like a face, never mind a specific face someone would recognize uh, so much admiration for people who can do that uh, it's a, a true gift or maybe because he's he's very observant mm. so i also think maybe he had some talent and throughout his life he's observed so much that it's come out in a way that he wasn't expecting also yeah his, maybe he had I to observe know. or take in so much to reach a threshold that it started pouring out yes <laughs> in that way 
Anyway, so and uh, so I, I recommend the, the book. I haven't read mm. it yet, but I've read quite a few of his, including Think, which I really liked. Yeah. yeah, Hidden Potential by Adam Grant. You're also reading something that might be of interest to our readers. Yes. Well, our the, listeners. The new Cal Newport book, Slow Productivity, mm-hmm. um, it hit my Audible queue. I'd had it on pre-order um, for a little while. And I'm I'm... Only about a third of the way in so far, um, but I I really love his writing and the way that his yeah. work has built on itself over years. From he first looked at deep work and the need to truly focus and in order to actually get things done in flow. Um, then his his work a few years ago on the the hive mind hydra of notifications yes. and noise that has pervaded the online space and how you've got to limit that so this is kind of the evolution of that which is really about how to take back being productive by doing less things or at least doing less things at the same time Um, and sort of the admin overhead that goes with each thing you have to be paying attention to each product in your life and it, it it's fascinating for me because my I suppose my first ventures into productivity geeking out started way back in the getting things done yes. days, um, it, which was really about, you know, getting stuff. If you're not doing it now, you have to have it in a trusted system. So you don't have to hold on to it in your head. And that's really, it's like coming full circle back to that, that you need to limit mm. your cue and that the people who've been truly productive and have made truly breakthrough accomplishments in history and creativity or problem solving have tended to be people that had very singular focus and they deliberately got rid of things that were distracting from that they they passed stuff off to other people they let things go um like andrew wiles who do who solved fermat's last theorem dedicated his life to it and didn't do sort of anything else except this one really narrow area of mathematics and apparently a lot of the myths about Jane Austen's early history aren't true and the fact that she got most of her creative, true creative writing done in a fairly short space of time when she actually had time and she wasn't caring for family members and things mm. like that. A lot of it ties into agile thinking and sort of your rule of three and only having a limited number of things in your current work in progress. Everything else has to be queued somewhere where it's not going to go away, it's not going to fall off or get forgotten about, and you can come back to it once you've cleared something off your plate. So yes, Jane Austen was an agilist, um, uh, <laughs> a getting things done person, yes. because she didn't clog her mind up trying to hold on to all these different projects. It's in my wish list. Um, I have to say, I think you kind of introduced me to Carl Newport because you talked about his podcast at, at one point, and I think maybe I had I had, don't think I'd read m- much of his work. And and thank you. Now I listen to his show, which is another show with long episodes, which I love. Yes. I love the fact yes. that they are long, and I think that shows. It's it's part of his ethos and brand, isn't it? You know, I take long and I go deep and. Yep. That's it. If you want to be with me, you have to stay with me for a while and focus on one thing. (laughs) I love it. Yeah, great. So that's Slow Productivity by Carl Newport. Before I go to the audio, which, you know, we have a nice segue, but I'm going to break the segue because... Another reader of the uh, newsletter, I tell you, it was a very good month. Uh, Bernie J. Mitchell, who, I mean, Bernie has been on the show sometimes, he's a co-working man. He actually recommended a book. And I don't know if I'll, I might put it on my wish list and see if at some point, but I think it, it, it sounds very interesting. It's a book by David Brooks, and it's called How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. And it's from last year, 2023. I'll just read the description just because I, unless you've read it. Have you read it, Maya? No, I haven't read this one. I'm sort of updating my Audible queue as we speak now. (laughs) Ah, well, there you go. (laughs) It's fascinating. It it does, it does, I have to say that I wasn't very sure about the, because of the title, but anyway, I'll read what the Amazon description says. There is one skill that lies at the heart of any healthy person, family, school, community, organization, or society. The ability to see someone else deeply and make them feel seen. To accurately know another person, to let them feel valued, heard, and understood. And he has something else. Uh, Driven by his trademark sense of curiosity and his determination to grow as a person, Brooks draws from the fields of psychology and neuroscience and from the worlds of theater, philosophy, history and education to present a welcoming, hopeful, integrated approach to human connection. 
I love the breadth of mm. re- of sources. I love these kind of books. And you imagine it's taken somebody years to research yes. this and, and put it together. <laughs> and it's so interesting, actually, because the the Pracy says, and yet humans don't do this well. And yet this is so the essence of humanness, yes. of, of yes. relating from one person to another. And um, to I'll just go into chat GPT mode in this era of... <laughs> <laughs> evolving electronic <laughs> communications we need more of this please we need more yes. of, of truly being seen seeing others deeply seeing what makes us yeah. unique and rounded human beings so yeah i i tempted to dive into this will be an audio book to take on a long hike or a long yes. journey or somewhere where you can just like spend hours with it without listening in little fragments here and there i think so yeah on Excellent. the list okay thank Great. you bernie and pilar <laughs> yes well day. thank you <laughs> Thanks, Bernie J. Mitchell. You can find Bernie on berniejmitchell.com. And he's got a a newsletter as well where he recommends also where he says what he tells you what he's reading. So, but let's uh, do a little segue into our audio recommendations. So coming back to Cal Newport, actually, Mm -hmm. and this listeners, this was by coincidence, his podcast, Deep Questions, I, I have to confess that I didn't finish the episode, but that was more because of when I started listening to it. But episode 294, it it's called A Tactical Assault on Busyness. And I'm going to say that I left the podcast and I can't believe I haven't come back to it before coming here today to record. It, I left it when it was talking about collaboration, especially online collaboration, whether you're co-located or not, but everyone uses lots of Slack or whatever it is, uh, and and lots of different um, communication tools, online tools to communicate. And he was just saying, it's not enough to have an agreement on how you're going to use the tools. That doesn't really solve the problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Where I thought, said that he's, <laughs> yeah, but that's great because he's going to go deep he's going to go deep into then then what what is it and i i suspect it's a complete mind shift about communicating about what work do we do when why are we doing the work you know probably quite deep reflections but i let i let that have you listened to that episode yet no i don't think i have again because his podcasts are so long they tend to be the ones that slide down my queue because i haven't got an hour and a half to necessarily devote to it. And I also, I do know he's shopping a lot of the book around at the moment. So there's some duplication there. I might as well just dive into the book. So, um, but he's always got great ideas. Yeah, I did like very much. He talked about hot potato (laughs) collaboration. I love it, which is that thing of, uh, here you go, now it's your problem. Yes, you catch. (laughs) I think that he first talked about that in the Hive Mind book, actually, this idea that it's part of that noise is people just trying to make things your problem. (laughs) Just Here's the hot potato. Now it's in your inbox because I've replied or I've replied all. So hopefully somebody else is going to pick it up and deal with the thing. And and you don't realise that all you're doing is creating a million other hot potatoes by replying all and they reply all. And so it goes. It's a great reminder that when we're looking at how to work online and how to integrate technology, whether it's remote collaboration tools or actually artificial intelligence now, is that we have to look at how we're working with each other mm-hmm. and then look at everything else. Because it doesn't matter what we're doing. If we, if we have this habit of passing work around and being all over the place together, then it's just, yeah, that's just going to transfer. So, I, yeah, I like, I like that very much. You've got, uh, you have a recommendation. Yes, I found we were talking um, when we were planning this episode and I was like, I don't seem to be listening to many podcasts about remote work at the moment. It's all this adjacent stuff. But one that I do enjoy listening to and made a point of catching up with was Long Distance Work Life with Marissa Eikenbury and Wayne Tamel. And they had a recent episode called it was press start on so work how gamers are influencing the future of remote work so that caught my eye as a title which i thought was great and they were talking about the so work platform which is one of those virtual office spaces and i remember when these came out a few years ago and we were playing with them in virtual team talk and yes. having these these virtual spaces and they never quite sort of caught on and yet they also haven't gone away either there is still very much a, an ecosystem of people who like to be in these virtual worlds. And of course, at the the technical extreme, we have the metaverses and things which are just aren't quite ready yet, as I think meta 
meta.com have, have found out for themselves and the technology people don't want to be in headsets and things but people do still especially digital natives are very comfortable with the idea of a persistent space digitally that you go to and where proximity and physicality is a thing this one so work looked really interesting as it, it's kind of a a 3d it kind of looked minecrafty to me <laughs> and and i suppose that reflection plays into this dynamic between Marissa and Wayne about generational responses to this, that if you're a gamer, if you're a digital native, if you grew up with Minecraft, then it's really easy to see why this would be a great way to go to work. And whereas if you, your experience of remote work started before all that, or started without going through that gaming, that visual matrix, then it's harder to see the point of why do I need to log into another thing and we're just doing the work anyway. But there were some nice touches that she was describing. And I haven't had a proper look at the platform itself personally. But one of the things was like proximity. If you're working in a virtual office, a little square bit on the map and somebody walks past, you can very easily just start a video call with them with one mm. click. Just when they're physically near to you, they're considered to be in an adjacent space in the same way you might look up when someone's passing your office door or whatever. So they've tried to really think about reducing that friction and making the spontaneity and the ambient stuff happen. And that is still the missing link in in remote collaboration. So I think it's it's a move in an interesting direction. And it would be great to see if this helps make remote work and remote collaboration feel more accessible, more engaging for uh, Gen Z and millennials who want to work in this way. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, me and Wayne will probably just turn our cameras off and get on with it. Yes. <laughs> well, that's, I think it, it, it is, it's so interesting, the diversity as well in what people want and need, because this is exactly what I'm thinking. I mean, I used to love this when we did it in virtual team talk, but actually I've come to appreciate that I don't want the office spontaneity mm. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but uh, i don't know online it always seems more controlled um so that's maybe yeah but miss it it's something there was one example she gave was about somebody decorated her office on her birthday oh yes she said she shared that on linkedin i know yes. that was so cool uh yeah <laughs> well that's you're never going to get that you know in a slack team or something you might get a gif or a, you know an emoji but it's not quite the same as coming into your space and finding somebody's thoughtfully done all that so i don't know how you do cake uh. yes <laughs> but that can well be i mean you hear so much about the, the return to the office uh, ar um, arguments or not arguments but uh, the, yeah the people who make the argument for the for going back that this is part of the thing mm. is that proximity spontaneity well if you manage to have something online yeah that fulfills that then you don't need to continue doing things you have to find another way. excuse yes <laughs> So I am really happy that you brought uh, this one. So it's long distance work life. It is it's quite recent, isn't it? Do we have a yeah, date? Oh yeah, fifteenth of April this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. You've been <laughs> prolific this uh, for three days. Fifteenth of April, twenty twenty four, and long distance work life. Press start on so work. How gamers are influencing the future of remote work. Funnily, I'm so glad you put it in there because I was going to recommend it, but I didn't have time to listen to it. Because again, I really like that show. I don't listen to it much uh, anymore for the same reasons we were saying, because it's uh, it, it, because of the topic. But I love Wayne and Marisa, and I've interviewed both of them in different podcasts, and it's just fantastic. So I'm glad you did that. Do we have another one? Or Yeah, we have one more. <laughs> Talking of uh, people who've been around for a while. Um, I found this one interesting. It's from Remote Work Life with uh, Alex Wilson Campbell. And uh, we've talked a few times online. Uh, well, we've recorded a few times. And this one is actually with Laurel Farr with, again... I haven't heard listened to something with Laura for ages because I saw so much <laughs> from her uh, over the last uh, five or six years. But it's interesting because if you are interested, she it tells a story of how she got into remote work and how basically she, it all started with her being in an office and they had to, I think it was they had to close down the office because something was going on. It was basically out of a need that she discovered that people could work away from each other because she had to organize, okay, we can't all come into the office. This has happened. How are we going to manage? And from then on, she saw, uh, she's always been very, very much about the business aspect of it when she started mm -hmm. and about how it can save money, how it can make everyone more productive. And then as she carried on looking into it, she realized actually that, 
personally, for society, all the other benefits, the more holistic benefits. And it's just interesting to hear her talk about where she came from, because I don't think I'd ever heard her talk about that. Mm, Yes, I feel like Laurel is somebody who you've just known around the ecosystem and her wisdom and experience for years, but I don't think I've heard her origin story. So I think I might have to check this one out. Yeah, it's really interesting. And it ends now with uh, GitLab. So they don't talk much about GitLab. I think when they recorded, she had just started. So anyway, so that's, uh, that is, do we have an, yes, episode 203 from the Remote Work Life podcast from office manager to international remote work expert with Laurel Farr. Right, well, we have, that's not bad. Is <laughs> my God, we, we're going on, oh, these people, they have such long shows. <laughs> no, yeah, we're and, almost hitting and we the haven't hour got anything again. to talk about on ours. <laughs> yes, it was just recommendations. <laughs> I love it. It's great. I'll just remind listeners, Pilar at virtualnotdistant.com. If you have any recommendations or you, you check the, and out any of these and you want to let us know, let's just wrap up with a with a quick what's going on from, from us. We might as well. Oh, I do want to say, though, Oh, um, Maya, before I forget, because, you know, I always forget about these kind of things. If you're looking for books and if you haven't read Thinking Remote yet, which is actually a, a collection of blog posts by Maya and myself, do read it. It's still selling. I don't know. It, it, it Well, I don't know if it's aged or not, but uh, people the are principles still buying it. Have. The principles are pretty timeless. So Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's still and it is... And it is a collection of blog posts, um, but we thought we'd put them out. And actually, Maya put a, a whole set of reflection questions at the end of each post, which are really, really add value. And if you'd rather read it in Spanish, we even have a <laughs> translation that I didn't do, Prisca did. And it's called Planteamientos del Liderazgo a Distancia. And of course, Maya has a couple of healthy, happy home working books as well. Yes, <laughs> so a series of two. <laughs> a series of two. <laughs> a couple. <laughs> Definitely a couple. <laughs> yes. What were they called? When it was Out of the Office was the first one and Finding Your Edge, the second one about boundaries. Um, yes. And yeah, it was always going to be more, but this, it was just moving too quickly, I think. And this, it was kind of hitting up against that backlash of working from home during lockdown yes. at the end of that. People didn't oh. want to hear about working from home. They wanted to hear about working from anywhere and yes. being a digital nomad and things like that. So, all right, you know, the books still stand, but I didn't do anything else with that branding. So, yes, yeah, but yeah. books hopefully yeah. stand the test of time. That I think that's why I'm investing more time in books and less on, on other mm. kind of um, writing uh, online as content uh, for, for those reasons. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm back on Twitter Yay. at Pilar Orti. Any of you who are there, I know it's called X, but I am calling it Twitter because I don't <laughs> like the word. And I have fa- I'm really I'm really enjoying it. One, I found a lot more people than I thought were still there. A lot more. And I I have to be careful because there's a lot. It's not that it, I wouldn't call it negativity, but because of what's going on in the world, it's a lot of, there's a lot of mm. new sharing. So you have to be careful not to read it all. Yeah. No one's saying, it's not like people are being negative about it. They're just sharing. There's it a lot of negative awful. stuff out there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and Twitter was bad. always that kind of fire hose of what's going on. And I like that. But but I, I don't know, someone today, people are also making jokes. It's I, I'm really enjoying it. I'm very slowly going in there and I'm not, sharing my I'm really you're still there aren't you well ish yeah I mean I've never really I've never sort left. of left as in watch mm. me flounce out of Twitter now it's not Twitter anymore um, but yeah. I haven't really spent any time there lately and it's really mm. interesting the way you you just described how you're enjoying it and it's making me think maybe I should I mean I tend to you know I share stuff to it in an automated way but I don't engage with other people and and Diana manages the Remote Work Europe Twitter, so I don't have to even log into that. <laughs> and maybe I need to take another look at it. I still feel like, I don't know, we're still in mourning for the proper Twitter. <laughs> it is very different to LinkedIn. I mm. found it, it's just, for me, it's just more fun. And I yeah. can, in a way, I can be more myself, as in I can just say something silly. <laughs> and it doesn't maybe I should matter. take another look. It's certainly true yeah. that none of the competitors have gained any traction really no. a year or so ago we're all th- oh we've got to be on threads and blue sky and this mm-hmm. and that none of them have really gone anywhere yeah, uh, we yeah. claimed all the usernames everywhere but it's just we don't seem to have grown any community there and i don't know many people who have yeah. to still seems to be where it's at and yes i'm still calling it that yes <laughs> great we start together uh, what else is going on with you 
Uh, what's going on with me? Well, I've been on, busy on another social network lately. Um, we've been doing, with Remote Work Europe, we've been doing a challenge on LinkedIn this month, which is where we bring together a cohort of people who are in the same kind of space, and that matters. They're all in remote interested in remote work and remote careers there's job hunters there's people not well not remote work professionals but remote work interested people and we we work as a cohort we all post at the same time every day and then we engage with each other's content and Mm -hmm. it's it's really interesting this is the third time we've done it it's always really good for everybody's LinkedIn engagement and stats. And, you know, mm-hmm. it gives me the discipline to post every day because I do not post every day. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I try and keep that good habit going. We do it for four weeks. Um, but this this is the largest one we've done. We've had about 20 people active in it. And it's actually, uh, we might have to cap it lower than that, mm-hmm. I think, in future mm-hmm. because okay. everybody's posts are so good and they're so interesting Um, that I'm spending far too long (laughs) reading and commenting and reading the comments because the quality of the comments in the interactions. And of course, it really works. It works really well because you get that burst of momentum and activity in that golden hour after posting. And then you get all these alerts like all the time because so many more people are then discovering that and coming in and adding to it. And yeah. it, it's really, really fascinating. I just, I couldn't keep it up all the time, though. <laughs> no, well, you don't want to as well. You don't. And actually, to I'm bring this sure back to. to our conversation about productivity books and literature, I wrote an article for the Estonians about getting things done. And uh-huh. David Allen, co um, accredited coach in Estonia. And so I made a post about the article on LinkedIn as part of this challenge. And it went, I mean, for me, it went viral as in like 3,000 views instead of 30. Oh, that's very good. And a comment from David Allen. (laughs) (laughs) We are not worthy. So that was just like one of those kind of social media moments. And he said he liked the article. And I was like, oh. (laughs) Oh, that's really good. So you see, it's really nice that that's happening on LinkedIn. I've, I've seen a few of those with some... Yeah, for some high profile people replying to people in my network. And that's, that's great. That made your day. You yeah, know? yeah. No, 3,000 really views is nice, but actually, <laughs> David Allen. <A> man. <laughs> yeah. And it yeah, was a lovely wow. thread because all the comments were like, oh, gosh, yes, this book changed my life too. And exactly. So was, yeah, yeah. You know, it was all very genuine and, and very sort nice. of authentic. And it's, yeah, it is a bit of a cult like thing, the GTD. You either, yeah. you either yeah, get it, it or you true. don't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I have to say. Uh, I, I almost ended up running workshops on that <laughs> for another company. Um, and um, and that's what you're doing online, but you're also doing something in person, aren't you? In person, yes. Going back to Bansko in Bulgaria. Um, oh, you did that last Ju- year, didn't I you? Did, I did it the year before, actually. Oh, the year before. The, I think Oof. the festival itself will be in its fourth year, and they're talking about having over a thousand digital nomads descending wow, my God. on this, this fairly small <laughs> town <laughs> in the Bulgarian Alps. And it was a really nice festival. It's, it's over a week, so it's quite chilled out. You've got stuff going on, but it isn't like one of those intense corporate FOMO multi-track things you know there's yeah, there's yeah. always something going on and it's yeah. it's very laid back and yeah I'm really looking forward to it it was it should be a good chance to catch up with some people that you know around the space and virtually and in face to face and also you know so it's nice to meet new people and of yeah. course I'll be talking about remote work Europe we have a discount link for tickets which I can give you if anyone wants to check it out Actually, yeah, I think it will be a code that they have to enter, but it's quite complicated. Um, okay. Well, as in, I do, it's not in my head at the moment. What okay. This, what this we'll put it in the show is, notes. But it's a 10% discount, so you might as well have it if you if you want to take a look. Um, and Bulgaria is very affordable for accommodation and things and, and food. Uh, when is it in June? Do you remember? It's the, it's the last week of June. So okay. it's like the 23rd or, or something, that, that final okay. week. But some people come and just come for a few days it's still worth it others come and stay for a month because it's cheap and you know yeah. if you're yeah, if yeah. you're a bit nomadic anyway it's a ni- it's a nice place to escape the the spanish summer as you're getting into july and, and you know some of the extreme weather that you might get in other places because it's quite high up so you get a lovely mountain climate so it's definitely worth a look. And I, I suppose the final thing that's gone on in my life, which it d- might be quite boring to other people, but I've changed my computer. <laughs> I've finally gone back to having a laptop again. 
um, which will, oh, okay. it will make it easier for me to go and do digital nomad festivals and to work from yes. anywhere and things like that. I had basically, I had a very elderly laptop that I needed to replace because it was going to let me down on a trip pretty yeah. soon. It was only starting okay. best out of three. And I was trying to figure out what to do because I love, love, love my huge monitor. So I had to really rethink it. And in the end, I traded in my, my big old Apple Studio. It's not that old, a couple of years ago, yeah. and got a MacBook Pro, but I've kept my big monitor and yes. My husband yeah. just stuck it to the wall, so I yes. can very good use that when I'm sat at my desk, or I can just take the cable out, <laughs> use use the laptop. It's really nice to have a laptop that's new and fast. Actually, you know, one of these oh, boiling frog things that it incrementally just gets worse and worse. But it was a pre-pandemic <laughs> MacBook Air. Yeah. Put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes. From another epoch. So yeah, the MacBook Air is fantastic. I still have mine. I use it only for writing though, but it still works. Yeah. It's so light. It's yes. Nice. I mean, it was great. This will be a, like a little bit heavier to carry around, but it's not like I do it all the time. Um, and it's you know, it's worth it. It's that extra inch why do we still measure it in inches the screen space good so finally uh, listeners if you still want to read more from us we've both got different kinds of newsletters so i'm uh, writing sp uh, at spiraling creativity which i'm mainly writing about I'm writing about writing a lot and using AI, but also not. And that's over at spiralingcreativity.substack.com. And Maya is writing under remote echoes over at mayamiddlemiss.substack.com. Yeah. Is it just reflections on your remote history? Yeah, remote, history? Yeah, remote, <laughs> remote gray hair and wrinkles. It's a very occasional... <laughs> piece because it's it's just what I feel in the mood to do yes. a longer form content I've also as as part of the remote work Europe newsletter I've added a new sequence there because my lovely colleague mm. Diana is doing the weekly newsletter now and rounding up all the jobs and all the stuff so I'm doing a, a mailing there on Tuesdays which is just okay. a remote reflections which is a much shorter and that's all it's all free it's all included in the, the remote work Europe newsletter free subscription but if you sign up you'll also be getting messages from me on Tuesday just with much shorter little powers of wisdom or or wine wines and rants occasionally <laughs> <laughs> I try to keep it positive <laughs> great and that's over at remoteworkeurope.eu yes forward slash okay. forward slash newsletter They'll I think to sign up for the yeah. thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> You'll find it. Good. Excellent. Well, Maya, thank you very much. Listeners, thank you very much for listening. If you want to get this in your inbox, it'll probably come out next week. You can go over to virtualnotdistant.com slash newsletter. It also has a digest of the Virtual Not Distant content in case, which mainly podcasts really, uh, there's not much blogging going on there. So... Thank you very much, Maya, for joining me for a what are we recommending <laughs> and going on <laughs> mix. <laughs> There's always more going on than we think when we sit yes, down to record true. this show. It's yes. been a great pleasure, Pilar. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, thank you, listeners, especially if you've made it to the, to the end of this episode. We are ever so grateful. Thank you very much for listening. A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast. We know there are many other shows for you to choose from. Remember to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app and you can check out the full show notes over at virtualnotdistant.com slash podcasts. Talking of podcasts, we have another show you can listen to, Management Cafe, which you should also be able to find on all podcast apps. I have been Pilar Ortiz. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.